All right. Uh, uh, thank you for the introduction. First, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me to this uh, uh, summer school, and uh, I'm happy to meet uh, with you here today. Um, so, yeah, uh, I'll be talking about um, how we are using in our lab um, nanoscale photonic structures uh, for molecular specific PDIR biosensors. So I will describe in two ways uh, that we are achieving this uh, using with plasmonics. Uh, that will be the first part of my talk. And in the second part, I will mention uh, how we are using dielectrics, um, uh, dielectric metasurfaces. To motivate, I would like to uh, a bit start with uh, on the biosensors, in particular mid-IR biosensors, and I will explain what I mean by uh, molecular uh, specific. So when you are uh, working for biosensing applications or biochemical applications, most of the time you have an unknown biological or chemical sample. And the questions that you ask is, uh, you know, if, if this is my sample, does it contain my target analyte? Where that target analyte could be, for example, a specific biomarker, a protein biomarker. Or it could be a bit more complex uh, uh, sample and you may be wondering what is the composition. For example, what is the content of lipid versus protein uh, within that? Or uh, it could be the structure and confirmation. Again, for example, within the context of protein, which actually plays a major role in our health as well as in our disease, these proteins go through conformational changes. And that's, for example, the one that is driving for neurodegenerative diseases that the protein become toxic. And the reason that they become toxic is because they change their conformation, their structure. And again, uh, the biology is all, all also similar to chemistry, that there are interactions that are going on, enzymatic reactions and other things. So yeah. most of the time you are interested in interactions and kinetics, for example, for pharmaceutical uh, applications. So um, there are various optical techniques, uh, or let's say there are various techniques in general from you know, let's say uh, uh, electrical to mechanical to optical. And within optical, there are also various techniques that you can use to address these questions. But one particular uh, uh, powerful technique uh, in optics is spectroscopy that can give you pretty much uh, an answer uh, to all of these questions at the same time. So the spectroscopy, you know, if you think about it, so the molecules that you are interested in consist of atoms that are connected to each other in certain ways. And this, uh, you know, uh, molecules uh, vibrate, so they are not static. So uh, these vibrations, uh, the fundamental uh, energy of these uh, vibrations uh, happen to lie in the infrared region. So if you shine uh, to your molecule with a broadband uh, radiation, you will be coupling to these different modes. And then if you look at absorption or transmission, uh, 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 so you will see these uh, specific lines that, th uh, that corresponds to these uh, different uh, molecular vibrations. And that uh, is actually called as a molecular uh, fingerprint. So that's the molecular uh, specificity. So um, this is kind of represented in this uh, 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 graph, the molecular specificity. So this is for photonics people when we com uh, consider mostly the wavelengths. And the upper scale is uh, for wave numbers when you uh, talk with mostly the spectroscopist. So in the mid range where we are uh, looking at this uh, direct absorption bands of these molecules, we are thinking uh, uh, mostly within, let's say, 3 to 10 micron range. And in terms of that uh, wave numbers, that corresponds around, let's say, 800, uh, 700 uh, inverse wave number all the way to 4,000 uh, uh, inverse wave number. And then you can see, for example, uh, the signatures of proteins happen to lie around 6 micron, DNA around uh, 9 to 10 micron, uh, uh, lipid has strong bands, as I will show you, around 3 to 4 micron. Uh, so those are some uh, biomolecules, but you can also have some other chemicals that uh, you may be interested in for explosive detection, for uh, environmental detection, uh, 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 serine. So you have in the mid-IR, in fact, uh, pretty much rich uh, chemical information that you can use for chemical identification. And the technique is, uh, of course, label-free and non-destructive, which is, uh, you know, what uh, you are uh, interested in most of the time. And uh, in terms of biology, I was trying to highlight a bit uh, in the uh, previous graph. So if you have a biological sample, let's say either a cell or a cell membrane, uh, uh, where you may be interested for pharmaceutical uh, uh, processes or within the cell membrane, let's say uh, you have a protein. So if you look at the mid-infrared spectrum, you can have pretty much all the distinct major biomolecules uh, popping up, the lipid bands, the, the, the protein bands, and the DNA bands. And you can access them all you know, with an uh, IR uh, radiation. 
And furthermore, when you uh, look at uh, some of these protein bands, uh, for example, you can do uh, some uh, uh, further uh, signal processing to understand different conformations within the protein. For example, alpha helical structure will have a different IR uh, peak than uh, the beta sheet uh, conformation. So you can get an idea about uh, the conformation uh, state of the protein. So the mid-IR has this advantage that it is uh, chemical specific, it's molecular specific, and the traditional use of uh, IR spectroscope has limitations. And uh, one of the limitations in particular, if you would like to you know, deal uh, with uh, uh, this type of systems where uh, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the thickness that you are uh, talking about is mostly within, let's say, 5 to 10 nanometer or so, uh, according to the Beer's law, uh, the absorption signal will be significantly small. So if you are uh, looking to the measurement, uh, the, the transmitted light, you will pretty much see nothing uh, getting out of it because the D uh, will be very small. Or if uh, D is, let's say, large, uh, the, uh, uh, if the dilution is low, then the uh, uh, you know, total effect uh, will be uh, quite small. So that's the sensitivity. And another difficulty is that you would like to look at all these measurements in aqueous environment. That's where the biology basically resides. So for example, if you look at the protein absorption band uh, that is indicated by the black line, and if you overlap it with the water absorption band, you are uh, unfortunately see that the water, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the the uh, uh, OH bands all also have a strong presence within the mid-IR spectral range. So if you have a very diluted sample, you will basically measure uh, the absorption signature of water rather than your analyte. So this is where we are thinking as a community, uh, the nanophotonics can actually help to overcome some of these challenges so we can move the technology uh, further uh, 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 in its use. So uh, uh, one of the reasons that uh, you know, uh, the sensitivity is low, that we can actually explain why it is low, is that you know, if you have this uh, mid-IR uh, wavelength that I was telling you in the order of 5 to 6 uh, micron, and if you have these uh, molecules that are, let's say, on the order of 10 nanometer or so, you can see that there's a strong, uh, you know, uh, there's a significant uh, size uh, mismatch uh, where the radiation is too low, too long, and the molecule is uh, too small. And this is where we can, uh, for example, use our, uh, you know, near field enhancements in the small uh, scale volumes that, uh, you know, Jeremy was also mentioning, you know, to 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 to, to confine the light even uh, more so that we can have, uh, you know, pretty strong interaction between uh, light matter. And this has been actually uh, 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 has been started to look at uh, within the mid IR uh, spectral content. So these are some of the people who have been contributing as well to the field. So, um, um, so one thing uh, uh, that we, uh, we we started to work in the Mark group about uh, ten years ago, and one question that we wanted to actually, you know, uh, open up is whether we can uh, use this technique uh, and uh, the uh, the nanophotonic enhancements in a way that we can actually start to look at uh, complex samples because that's when you generally kind of face if you talk with a biologist that they are you know not interested with just like uh, very pure samples they would like to look at you know interactions of many different analytes simultaneously so uh, this is in collaboration uh, with uh, Sangin Ho's group uh, in U USA um, who actually gave us uh, the ALD coating uh, for this um, for these uh, uh, optimized structures, uh, which are called multi-resonant structures. And uh, Hila Lushwell's group, who's a chemist, uh, a biochemist, let's say, uh, in EPFL, who gave us uh, the uh, biological samples, uh, uh, in particular neurotransmitters. So I will show you how we actually use uh, this plasmonic, uh, 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 let's say, landscape uh, to have a molecular specific information on dynamic lipid membrane <coughs> uh, processes. So I was uh, kind of uh, trying to motivate in the beginning, uh, you know, if you talk, for example, with the cell, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the membrane is one of the major uh, building block. And uh, within this membrane, uh, you have, of course, uh, the lipid molecule, which is the major molecule, but you also have, uh, you know, uh, proteins that are embedded with it, or sugars, or uh, different contents embedded with it. And this is basically the main interface for most of the drugs and uh, for most of the interactions uh, between cells. And one uh, uh, model system that uh, people use in biochemist uh, labs uh, uh, is this uh, so-called uh, supported lipid bilayers, which can actually uh, mimic a uh, bilayer system uh, that you can uh, probe some of the complex uh, biological interactions in a, let's say, in a smaller, uh, in a, in a reduced uh, complexity. So. 
uh, in order to you know uh, look at uh, the uh, this uh, process, basically you need to have a substrate that can look at different biochemical uh, components uh, simultaneously. So one design uh, that we uh, basically uh, uh, came up with is uh, this uh, unit cell, which contains basically multiple subarrays having scaled antenna lengths and periodicity. So here you see the unit cell. You have uh, one, uh, uh, the, the fundamental mode uh, with the length L1 and uh, P1. Then you can actually cascade in a fractal uh, manner different le lengths and different uh, periodicities to support uh, resonances at different uh, 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 wave number. So uh, we have been targeting two wave numbers. One is uh, to address uh, the protein band and the other one to address uh, the lipid band. And in terms of wave numbers, those happens around 16 uh, inverse wave numbers, so that's around 6 micron or so. And then uh, the lipid uh, is around uh, 3,000 wave number, so that's about 3.5 uh, 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 micron or so. And then you see in the uh, in the uh, in the uh, CSD simulations uh, that you can have uh, the resonances uh, that we uh, that we have uh, defined. And uh, the nice thing about this, uh, uh, let's say, relatively simple uh, design is that it's uh, relatively uh, flexible in terms of tuning each resonant uh, uh, each resonant frequency independent from each other. So I can actually, you know, optimize it to match uh, as best as with my protein, and then the other one I can optimize uh, to match as best as as best as uh, with my lipid. And then you can actually do more than two. You can, you know, if, uh, uh, this is what I uh, will show as the results. But if you like, uh, if you want, you can have three or four in a cascaded manner that you can have pretty large number of resonances all uh, excited uh, very high efficiency, which is actually what we care uh, when we do spectroscopy. And then you can have uh, pretty, uh, pretty much uh, very wide spectral coverage uh, from, uh, from 1.5 micron all the way to 10 micron with individual tuning capability. So the experimental setup is uh, as follows. So we have uh, a calcium fluoride substrate, which is transparent to IR radiation. We fabricate these uh, structures by uh, e-beam lithography out of gold. And then we put a tin uh, uh, silica coating and ALD coating, which basically enables us to interface with the lipid, uh, with the lipid uh, membrane. And uh, so uh, to form the lipid membrane, we send the uh, lipid vesicles. So when they come to the surface, they rupture. And then uh, you form uh, this uh, very stable uh, supported lipid bilayer. And uh, we do the measurements in the back reflection that you shine the IR radiation for an objective and then look at uh, the reflection. So this is the reflection showing these two resonances. And the dips in these two resonances are due to the presence of water, which is, of course, existing in our solution. And then uh, when you put, uh, when you form this, uh, uh, introduce these vesicles and form the membrane, you see these uh, small dips appearing. So those are the dips that are, uh, you know, <coughs> appearing uh, due to the presence of uh, the uh, CH2 lipid bands. And then if you do a baseline correction and then uh, extract the signal, this is typically what we look at as differential absorption, the signature uh, of, uh, of, of, of the analyte. So. Um, as, the, uh, uh, as the essay, uh, one thing that we wanted to show as the first one is to look at this membrane uh, protein uh, association. So the, uh, the, uh, the essay is as follows. We introduce the lipid vesicles. They form uh, the uh, lipid bilayer. And uh, some of these lipids has biotinylated tag. So when we introduce streptavidin, the streptavidin starts to accumulate. So that's what we call the association. So if you look at this uh, process in, as a function of time, so that's the time, and then we acquire the uh, IR signatures in this differential absorption, this is pretty much uh, your raw data. And then you see as a function of time, uh, the, the, the strength in certain bands are increasing. So if I say that the CH2 band is mostly representing my lipid and MI uh, spectrum is mostly uh, representing my pr uh, protein, and if I uh, integrate, you know, what we call integrated absorbance, and then watch out what is uh, happening in the CH2, you basically see that as the lipid is uh, coming into the system, you see that it's increasing and it saturates, meaning the bilayer has formed. And, uh, and uh, we in simultaneously, if you look at what is happening in the amide, so when the lipid is kicking in, the signal is dropping. And the reason the signal is dropping is that as the lipid is getting in, it's actually kicking out the water, and then you can see actually even the water displacement. 
So uh, that's you know when everything is stabilized, and then you you know you remove uh, uh, whatever is uh, unbound, and then when you introduce your uh, protein, you basically see that the signature in the amide band is increasing due to the presence of water. But uh, simultaneously, as the protein is uh, uh, getting in, you also see some uh, uh, increase in the CH2 band because even though we said everything is molecular specific. The protein has its most strong band here, but it also has some presence here. So that's actually one of the challenge that uh, as uh, the molecules have some common bands, so it is not completely possible to integrate uh, uh, the two simultaneously. So instead, what we did is uh, if your reference signal of, let's say, if your protein is uh, you know, pretty much consistently protein and uh, not changing its form whatsoever, which is the case, during all this interaction, you have a fixed reference uh, protein signal, you have a fixed uh, reference uh, lipid signature, then you can actually do a linear regression to this raw data. So instead of looking this Mi2 and CH2 band, now you can actually treat this uh, raw data and then you can look at uh, structavidin and lipid band. So with that actually, you know, instead of going this road, then we can go in this road. So instead of these uh, 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 bands, you have the uh, specific uh, molecules uh, signatures. So as you can see now that the two things are decoupled. So as the lipid is uh, forming, I mostly see the lipid signal uh, is uh, you know, showing up and nothing changing in the protein. And then when I introduce the protein, you basically see an increase in the protein channel, but uh, you know, in the stable position, nothing on the lipid. So that gives me a pretty much a good control on, uh, uh, on uh, you know, uh, monitoring two analytes simultaneously. So um, as we established this technique, one um, uh, you know, uh, case that we wanted to actually address uh, uh, is um, you know, to look at uh, some processes that are really difficult uh, to study with uh, current techniques. And one of these processes is called uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, so-called mass-preserving process. So what's a mass-preserving pr process? Let's say you have uh, an analyte 1 and you introduce your analyte 2. So it doesn't only associate, you know, it doesn't bite on it, but it actually you know, uh, removes uh, or it makes pores or it removes, uh, 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 it removes the analyte. So for example, that's one of the cases that if you have some toxin proteins that they insert in, in self into the membrane and they kick out uh, the lipid molecule. So at the end, for example, uh, when you come uh, from this process to this process, the lipid is removed, the protein is inserted, so the total mass is more or less same. So if you do, let's say, SPR type measurement or uh, QCM type of measurement, it will be very difficult to see because the total refractive index is more or less same. But if I know that uh, whatever getting in and whatever getting out is chemically distinct, then with my technique, with, with this technique that we are developing, we can actually resolve. And this is what we wanted to do. So we treat uh, our surfaces in the same way that I was uh, telling you. And uh, we introduce these vesicles. And then we form a lipid uh, uh, bilayer. So we introduce a melitin, which is a toxin protein, which basically uh, perturbs a disruption in the membrane. And we wanted to look at these disruption processes. And then you can see that if I have like this lipid channel and protein channel separated from each other, then I can actually simultaneously measure both process. So as I introduce my melitin, you basically see the lipid decreases as a function of time. So it's a very uh, uh, clean system to look at in a chemical specific format. So of course, one of the next, uh, let's say, uh, process uh, uh, or next level of complexity to add is to add uh, uh, vesicles. Okay, so the vesicles are uh, pretty important in biology uh, and they can be pretty complex. They can have like uh, things inside what they call cargo. Um, uh, for example, these cargos could be, uh, can be used in the form of drug delivery to introduce some uh, 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 genetic material. So it's kind of like, let's say, a synthetic virus uh, that can infect you for uh, curing purposes. Or in the case of, for example, uh, uh, neurons, uh, there are the synaptic vesicles that uh, you know that carry neurotransmitters for uh, signaling purposes, and in the case of uh, also cancer, uh, the uh, exosomes uh, are considered to be uh, uh, pretty important to uh, make changes, uh, to some trigger uh, in, in, in the cancer process. So. Um, 
uh, the, the, pros, uh, the, the assay that we developed to look at these vesicles and the release of cargo from this vesicle, we functionalized the surface, in this case, uh, a bit differently. So we had this uh, long chain of uh, cholesterols uh, that basically can insert themselves into these vesicles. And these vesicles are uh, loaded. These are synthetic vesicles, uh, synaptic vesicles, uh, that are loaded with uh, GABA, which is a neurotransmitter. Uh, so we, uh, you know, uh, 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 basically, uh, you know, uh, immobilize them in the surface, and then we introduce this melatonin that I was telling you, which interacts a bit differently than uh, the supported lipid membrane when they interact with these uh, rumped vesicles on the order of 100 nanometer or so, let's say 50 to 100 nanometer or so, they actually insert holes, uh, pores. And then uh, uh, if the pore is uh, large enough, then your uh, neurotransmitter, which is typically very small, can actually release. And then we can look at this cargo release all in, a, uh, in, a, uh, in real time in a, uh, without any labels. And then uh, uh, to do that, uh, you know, we had uh, the system was already optimized to look at lipid and melatonin. Luckily, the, the, this, uh, the reference signal of uh, neurotransmitter GABA had also had, uh, you know, uh, absorption lines uh, within our antenna resonances, in particular at the MI band. But using this, uh, you know, linear regression, given that this has a, a, a significant different signature uh, than, uh, uh, than melatonin and lipid, we can actually do this uh, linear regression successfully. And this is actually, you see the assay uh, result, the linear regression result now at three different channels. So you uh, basically see the introduction of uh, lipid vesicles uh, together with the GABA in it, as well as outside uh, in the solution. So when we wash it, you basically see uh, the stabilization of the GABA, which comes only uh, the ones uh, that are inside the vesicle, and the lipid signal is uh, stable. And when I introduce the melatonin, uh, the melatonin uh, signal increases. Nothing happens to the vesicle, meaning that they are intact, uh, but they have now the pores so that the, uh, the cargo can be released. So this is, you know, we are looking all these processes uh, in real time as uh, things happen without uh, any, uh, any labeling. So this is, uh, you know, we are quite excited about this platform. In fact, uh, a few people contacted us to, you know, for, to use this uh, 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 technology with their real samples. So now we are looking with real uh, synaptic vesicles that are extracted from uh, rat brain uh, to understand, uh, you know, not melatonin in this case, but in another protein called alpha synuclein to look at uh, vesicle uh, uh, and, uh, you know, this protein interaction. So in fact, uh, what we are, you know, uh, trying to project is, you know, how this, uh, you know, uh, the uh, neurotoxin proteins interact and then play a role uh, in the disease pathology. And one of the things that is also important is when they insert uh, themselves uh, onto the vesicles, there are conformational changes that are uh, going on. And this is also something that we have been working in my lab within the last uh, two, three years, that, you know, we can look at this uh, uh, plasma enhanced infrared structure and deduce from that uh, signal the conformational state of the protein. And this is something we did with alpha strychnine protein, which plays a role in Parkinson's disease. And uh, uh, just this year, uh, a couple of months ago, we can also show that we can do, uh, uh, for the first time, this uh, real-time in institute secondary structure analysis of proteins at the monolayer level uh, that you can actually uh, look at uh, folding and misfolding of uh, uh, protein. So this is now what we are kind of trying to integrate with the lipids, uh, with the proteins, and uh, with uh, these uh, you know, neurotransmitters all together uh, to look at uh, conformational and interaction uh, processes. So that's, let's say, one direction to increase uh, the complexity in terms of uh, biological functionality. And uh, in this case, I will say uh, the plasmonic systems are, uh, are relatively uh, uh, strong. Um, but in the same time, we are also looking, you know, uh, various new ways to make spectroscopy, uh, 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 let's say, in a different format. So one thing that we all know as a society is that uh, plasmonics have uh, uh, really nice uh, small mode volumes. Uh, but one of its limitations is the quality factor. And then, you know, if you look at from a spectroscopic perspective, you see basically the resonances, you know, the plasmonic resonances and the line width, right? So that's basically, you know, the quality factor is less than 10, right? On the order of seven, uh, <laughs> 7 or so. And then if you look at the absorption lines of the molecules, you kind of see that there are these little dips. So the absorption line of uh, molecules, which are on the order of 40 to 50 wave number, is uh, much, uh, much uh, uh, narrower than the line width of plasmons. 
So we started to ask uh, the question, what happens if you have a, uh, if instead of uh, having a high Q system, a uh, low Q system, what happens if you have a low Q, uh, high Q system where the Q of uh, the uh, resonances is comparable or less, uh, um, Q, uh, the line width of these resonances is comparable or less than the uh, line width of the, of, of the molecules. So can we have a new way uh, to do spectroscopy? And this is actually where we started to work, of course, with dielectric. So that's the advantage of dielectric is that it can offer uh, higher quality factors. So that's basically what I was just telling you, that the Q of the gold is uh, less than 10. And in the case of uh, mid-IR, as uh, they are pretty much uh, through to, uh, metal, it doesn't really make a big difference to go from gold to silver or copper. They are all uh, within the same range. So that's how you know, our uh, molecular uh, signature looks like. So in the case of a high Q system, so if the Q is narrower than this line width, then what you will do is if you add the unlight, instead of these little small dips, you will see a strong uh, you know, transmission drop or reflection uh, drop in the system. So the question is actually, can we harvest this in a, in a new way? And here the advantage will be is that I will be probing this at a very specific wave number, right? So that's uh, the high Q defines me this uh, uh, you know, very specific uh, wave number. But if, you, if I would like to do spectroscopy, that means I would like to also probe different uh, uh, different wave numbers. <coughs> so uh, how we can go from this uh, one, let's say, selective frequency to multiple frequencies to do spectroscopy. And this is actually uh, how we, uh, you know, introduced uh, to, uh, uh, you know, to do uh, spectrum. So we basically design, uh, uh, design a so-called pixelated uh, dielectric metasurface. Let's say this is uh, representatively five by five arrays, and each array uh, has a resonant at a specific wave number, a high Q resonator. And then let's say this guy has at a, at a different uh, wave uh, number and uh, so on and so forth. So all these 25 uh, pixels are basically scanning from this, uh, uh, you know, 14, 000, uh, 1400, sorry, to 1800. So 400 wave numbers. And the thing is that there is uh, the key point here, here is that because of high Q, I have one to one uh, spatial to spectral uh, mapping. And uh, the design is actually given to us by our collaborator from Australia, Yuri Kivshar's group. Uh, so this is uh, uh, made out of uh, 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 amorphous silicon, uh, uh, you know, uh, standing on a uh, low index substrate, uh, let's say calcium fluoride or uh, magnesium fluoride. And the way uh, uh, the, the resonances are basically tuned is that we have these tilted uh, ellipticals. So the tilt angle we don't change, but we change uh, the periodicity in both direction as well as the size of ellipse all simultaneously, like kind of like scaling up the whole structure like a PowerPoint, zoom in and zoom out. And that's how we basically uh, tune at different uh, wave numbers. And then one thing that was good is that uh, these are high Q. Uh, I will tell you what is uh, high Q. And the other thing that was uh, nice uh, is that it was spectrally clean. So as I tune uh, this or scan this from 1 to 1.3, you basically see that no other modes are popping in the spectral range. So that was, uh, that was the good thing. Uh, and the other good thing is that you know, the field is uh, outside the dielectric resonator. So that's important for you know, enhancing the light matter interaction for, for the case of sensing. So the Qs are, uh, in theory, uh, was on the order of 200, which is actually pretty sufficient. So if you, uh, uh, if you remember, the Q of plasmons were about seven, on the order of seven. Uh, uh, so that's about, um, that's about 200 to 250 wave numbers. So if I go from seven to 200, so, they, so, so your uh, uh, line width is on the order of 10 wave number, and my the absorption line of analyte is about 50 wave numbers. So I am well, you know, uh, with, uh, you know, I don't need to kill myself to go Q of uh, more than 100 or 200. So when you put your uh, molecule, so that's the line width that I was talking about, and this is the line width of the molecule. So when you put your uh, molecule, of course, uh, the one, the, the, the pixel that is overlapping uh, uh, with the strongest absorption band will be reduced in strength 
and the one that is you know, a bit lower will be reduced, uh, let's say, a bit less, and the one that is not overlapping with the absorption bands will not get affected. So if you look at you know, all, the, uh, all the resonances, you can basically trace out uh, the absorption signature. And the nice thing is that this, uh, spectral, uh, this spectral position is associated to a, a spatial position. So what I do is I'm basically converting this absorption into a molecular barcode, in a two-dimensional molecular barcode. So we fabricated these structures in my lab. Uh, using uh, amorphous uh, silicon uh, and the substrate was magnesium fluoride uh, um, and then we do e-beam lithography and uh, 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 fluorine based uh, dry plasma etching so you basically see that we have 10 by 10 pixels each of them is about uh, is not about it's exactly 100 micron by 100 micron with certain spacing and then this is what uh, the S parameter that I was telling you uh, for tuning uh, the resonances uh, and that's basically the scaling uh, factor S. So we had uh, this uh, system that we have a broadband uh, IR radiation and a an, uh, an large area broadband uh, IR uh, imaging detector. So uh, we can uh, uh, pretty much see all these uh, resonators simultaneously in a single, uh, in a single shot. So if you look at, for example, uh, if uh, the IR source uh, was coming in this case uh, uh, from a tunable QCL, so we can basically see you know, uh, the, resonant, uh, the resonant spatial points for each uh, wave number. And that's what I was telling as uh, the spatial and uh, spectral uh, mapping. And then we have all these 100 uh, you know, uh, spectrum. And then you see the experimental Q values are consistently uh, uh, at 100 for all the, uh, all the pixels. So what you do is, like in the, in the simulation that I was showing you in the beginning, so this is the spectrum uh, 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 from uh, uh, the metapixel before analyte, and when we put uh, after analyte, you basically can trace uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the absorption lines, and you can extract, and then you can uh, pretty much uh, see uh, you know, the signature of the protein, and then this is just uh, you know, uh, another reference uh, measurement just to show that uh, you know, it's, there is a very well color correlation. But the nice thing that we are excited about this system is that actually we can do uh, spectro we can retrieve spectro uh, spectroscopic signature without a spectrometer. So what we call spectrometerless operation. So for that, you know, what you need to do is uh, if you go back, you know, instead of let's say a tunable laser, you have a broadband illumination, and then you look at the reflection. Uh, the reflection is uh, looked at you know, with, a, uh, with a spatial result, uh, an IR imager, so you get the spectrum at one spatial point, and then you would like to look at refer, uh, the, refer, uh, the reflection before and after uh, analyte. And that's what you know, the, the detector pixel will spit out uh, uh, for the readout. So you can basically see that from the spectrum, before and after analyte, there will be a decrease. And then we kind of uh, treated our uh, original experimental uh, uh, data in this way. And then you can see the barcode, the molecular barcode that I was telling you uh, of, the, of, of the protein. And uh, you, know, you can uh, you know, implement this in a, in a reflection manner. Uh, we also have an SI, SI data that you can also do this in, in a transmission. So you have a broadband illumination. It can be even in a lens-free format that you have a uh, uh, you know, collimated imaging, uh, uh, a collimated uh, illumination source, a pixelated metasurface, which is basically sitting on uh, your pixelated IR detector. So you can uh, trace out in the transmission mode uh, you know, the spectrum of uh, your analyte without any spectrometer. And, uh, uh, and uh, this is just, uh, you know, uh, the illustration. For example, this was uh, the molecular barcode of protein. So if we change another material, let's say a polymer, you see the barcode completely changes because it has a different spectrum. Or in this case, uh, 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 we put an environmental uh, glyphosate uh, uh, on the uh, envir envir environmental uh, uh, factor of, uh, uh, for glyphosate. So you basically see uh, that uh, the molecular barcode is completely different. So if you want, you can basically stay in this uh, molecular barcode image. Uh, but if you also do a reference calibration, you can also convert this uh, back to spectrum if you like. But we are uh, kind of believing that it's, uh, 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 it's better to stay in the molecular uh, uh, barcode image because you can do a lot of um, you know, uh, image analysis and image uh, 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 processing techniques. 
So in addition to this uh, uh, chemical identification, we also showed in this paper that you can do compositional analysis. For example, if you have, a, a, if you have an, a, a mix of analyte, in this case a polymer, a mix, uh, a mix of PMA and PE, and if you know the reference uh, you know, barcode of uh, one component and the other, which are uh, you know, uh, chemically distinct, you can uh, pretty much do an image analysis to find what is the you know composition. So in this case, we we you know we did you know we know what which composition we, uh, we put, and then from our uh, chemical image, we were actually able to extract uh, you know exactly uh, the compositions that we were uh, 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 implementing. So you can. Uh, you know, we did with two uh, analytes, but we kind of visualized that you can, you know, have a mixture, and then if you have a barcode library, uh, you can uh, do a lot of, uh, you know, of, uh, uh, this uh, linear decomposition processes to find uh, what is the right composition. Or you can also envision that you can do more sophisticated image processing algorithms. Imagine that, you know, the Facebook recognizes your face, you know, of, uh, within a crowd uh, uh, of audience, uh, so you can actually do pretty sophisticated image analysis techniques. So this is kind of where we are um, trying to kind of head this uh, uh, technology further. So um, with that, I would like to just uh, uh, kind of end uh, this uh, uh, talk. So in the beginning, I was just showing one direction where we are heading more to you know, um, go from the complexity of biology and biochemistry, which is very exciting and brings a lot of challenges in that direction. And another direction that we are heading, especially in mid-IR, is that you know the instruments are very bulky. That we know of FDIRs and you know of, uh, you know of, uh, QCLs and everything uh, expensive. So we are kind of uh, you know going in another direction. That can we actually use nanophotonics to do miniaturization, uh, uh, where we can have inexpensive and still very powerful mid-IR uh, spectroscopy systems. And that's where we think this uh, type of imaging uh, platforms could be useful. And uh, with that, I would like to acknowledge uh, my group members, in particular Andreas, uh, Phyllis, Alexanders, uh, who worked on the dielectric parts, and um, uh, Aurelion, Dordane, and Daniel, as well as Andreas, worked on the, on the first part with the, uh, with the plasmonics, as well as uh, the funding sources, and most importantly, my collaborator for uh, dielectrics, uh, Yuri and Dragomir from Australia. And uh, for the first talk, I mentioned uh, uh, for Sang Yung, Nathan, and Hilal uh, for the plasmonics. Yeah, with that, I can uh, take the questions.